Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I'll be talking again remotely with, with Dr. William Seeds. Dr. Seeds is an orthopedic surgeon who practices in Ashtabula, Ohio. Good afternoon, Dr. Seeds. Good afternoon, Randy. Thanks for having me on today. Well, thanks for joining us. And, and what I thought we would discuss today is, a, is another shoulder topic. And that topic is, is a condition that um, uh, I think is a fairly common uh, condition in the shoulder, and that is the slap lesion or a labral tear. So I think probably first we're going to have to explain to patients a little bit about what the labrum is in the shoulder, what it does, and, and exactly what happens when we suffer a slap lesion. So with that, how about starting off and telling us what the labrum does? Sure, Randy. I, the, the labrum in the shoulder is what we would call a static stabilizer of the shoulder and actually a cushion within the shoulder that holds the ball and joint, helps hold the ball and joint stable and creates what we call that negative pressure within the shoulder. Um, kind of the vacuum seal, so to speak, of the shoulder joint. And that labrum is a cushion that goes all the way around the cup and it helps to keep the congruent motion of the shoulder as it goes through its normal range of motion of the joint. Uh, and it, you could almost compare it to the meniscus in the knee of how that works as the shock absorber in the knee and protects the cartilage. Um, this in, in the shoulder, it has a, a little bit more of a function of also stabilizing the joint and creating, as I said, that negative pressure to kind of vacuum seal that shoulder in place. Yeah, I think we should point out to, to patients who may not be familiar with this type of anatomy that the, the labrum is actually a soft tissue. It's, it's not bone. It's not necessarily cartilage. It's this soft tissue that's like the meniscus, very gritty and gristly. Uh, it also attaches to the capsule around the, the glenoid socket, and it and it turns that fairly flat surface of the glenoid, which, is, which makes up the socket of the shoulder, into a little bit more of a cup formation. So it, like you say, it, it works kind of like a gasket uh, and also kind of like a ligament. So it, it does several different things in the shoulder. Um, when we're talking about a slap lesion, when we're talking about injuring this structure, what are we talking about? Uh, usually a slap lesion, which is a capital S-L-A-P, we're talking about a superior labral anterior posterior injury. And that's basically where the biceps tendon comes up into the shoulder joint and attaches at what we call the biceps anchor, where the biceps tendon intercedes and connects to the labrum, and that labral cushion is what then can tear off of the bone of the cup. And it can happen in the front, it can happen in the back. And it, we really, you know, we have classifications of how, where that tear is and what we define it. But basically that labrum can tear superiorly in the front or in the back and it can peel, it can tear. Um, so they're, they're different, different uh, uh, words that we use in describing that, but that's basically what happens to that labrum. Now, is this an injury that occurs all at once? Do we tear our labrum and it's torn and it begins to give us problems after that one episode? Is this more of a degenerative condition that occurs over time? How do you see these types of injuries occurring? I think we see these in all different realms of activity. We can see them first time traumatic injury, we can see it in repetitive motion type of activities. We can see it in sporting activities that are repetitive. Um, we can see it in degenerative modes uh, of, of degenerative tears that can occur over time in aging and, and so forth. So we do see these in different stages in sports specific or trauma specific um, injuries. Now, now, if I'm a patient and I've suffered an injury to my shoulder and I'm having maybe some type of pain or some sort of problem with the shoulder, what leads you and me as the patient, you as the orthopedic surgeon and myself as the patient, to suspect that what's going on may be a slap lesion? What sort of symptoms am I going to have? Well, I think it's important to start out 
by getting a good history from the patient of what, what exactly has occurred. Uh, so you, you can actually pick up a lot from just the history as far as was there a distraction type of injury, was there a, maybe a, an ex, you know, a hyperextension type of injury, a compression injury, a distraction injury of the shoulder. Uh, um, these things are important in, in trying to understand the mechanism or was it, is this a pitcher that's just had repetitive pitching and starting to lose speed and um, lose control and pain and so forth. So there are a lot of things you try to put together just from the history and then we move on to the inspection and exam of the shoulder where we can pick up a lot uh, as far as there are some specific testing uh, activities of the shoulder that we can do to kind of reproduce some compression against that labrum and maybe reproduce some of the symptoms and pain in the exam that make us more suspicious uh, towards that injury. Um, and also we can look by inspection, we can look at the mechanics of the shoulder, the scapula, and the shoulder itself and see if we see any impending problems in just the mechanics that may have led to this problem. From there, um, if, if we've looked at an x-ray and it looks, looks okay and we don't see any little bony injuries that can, be, that can occur, you know, bone injuries that can occur in the, lab, uh, in the glenoid with the labrum, uh, if that's okay, you know, we can move on to the MRI also that can be assisting in, in telling us if there's been a labral injury. Well, I think we ought to point out to patients that, that the MRI scan shows us these soft tissues so much better than plain x-rays or, or even a CAT scan for that matter, unless you actually put dye in the shoulder. But the MRI scan has been a wonderful tool to, to allow us to see some of these soft tissue structures in, in any joint. And it's, it's really revolutionized our ability to make the diagnosis of a, things like a slap lesion in the shoulder or a biceps tendon tear or even the rotator cuff tear has been revolutionized by the MRI scan. And I'm assuming that, that if you've got a, a painful shoulder, that at some point you're probably going to, to get an MRI scan of that shoulder pretty much as a routine matter these days. Is that accurate? Uh, yes, Randy, that's correct because I, I really believe it, it makes a it really assists you in, in making that plan for the patient and giving them some realistic expectations of where you can go with it. And, and I think, you know, if, if there's any type of tear uh, of, a st of a structure that leads to stability problems or, or, or uh, pain problems in the shoulder, such as a labral injury, um, the patients need to be aware of, of what the potential problems can be in the future. And, and, and you want to be able to give them a a concise and accurate you know diagnosis is as soon as you can because any time you lose in that process uh, the, the patient I don't think is going to be very happy with that process. Well you mentioned that we have different types of slap lesions different grades of slap lesions if you will can you give us some idea of what the natural history of the slap lesion is in, in other words when we talk about natural history what we're talking about is if I don't if I choose not to treat this injury and I choose just to put up with the symptoms whether it's pain or clicking or even instability what does that mean for me long term is it is it something that I can just choose to put up with or should I consider seriously having it fixed well I, I think that enters into uh... A, a very good discussion that you can have with your patients as far as you know the, your, ex, your personal experience with these patients over time and, and what we see in the literature and, and I think that we've seen a lot of things changing as we've become more aware of these these injuries themselves. Uh, you know I, I think what I try to do with the patients is I tell them that most of these labral tears when you pick them up um, they, they potentially uh, may not have the ability to repair themselves. But I also explain to the patient that they certainly have the opportunity to try to work around this labral tear uh, to do things to strengthen the rotator cuff and to understand more of the mechanics of their shoulder where, where sometimes they, they can improve that situation without surgically intervening to repair that, that labrum. Um, they learned how to modify some of their activities uh, and, and that, you know, you, you can get patients through, through that process. Um, I try to let them know that these labral tears, uh, 
they can progress, they can lead to other problems including biceps injuries, um, they can lead to instability problems, impingement problems. So I try to educate them as to where the potential can go with these, um, understanding that, that they certainly have the ability to control these problems. Um, and, and we talk more about also that, that sometimes, you know, depending on that type of a labral tear, that, that sometimes it is better off, you know, to take a conservative route than, a, than an operative route, uh, depending on the injury. So I guess, I guess to paraphrase what you're saying is that just because you have a slap lesion or a labral tear doesn't necessarily mean that you need to start out with surgery. You feel like that some of these can be treated or at least ignored to some degree as long as patients are willing to put up with the minor symptoms. And, and those symptoms might be improved with some physical therapy and some adjustment of activities. Is that accurate? Yes, Randy, that's very accurate. I, I actually have a description with my patients where I call it a skillful neglect of that tear initially. And we're, we're, not, we're not discrediting the fact that you have a tear, but we're going to take this step forward and let's see where we can go with this because you may find that, hey, we can control our symptoms, you understand your limitations, and, and you, you have people that absolutely want to take that route and, and work around it. Now, when you're having this discussion with patients, what would drive you to actually telling the patient that they're better off with surgery, that you would recommend that they go ahead and, and proceed to a surgical solution? Well, number one, if they've, if, if, they've had, if they've had more than one injury, if it's been a recurrent injury, uh, number two, if they've been through any type of therapeutic uh, process and, and it has failed or they did well with it and they've had recurrent symptoms, uh, those people all I'll Im immediately discuss thinking about taking that operative approach. Um, if the tear, if if I feel that the tear has uh, been there for a while and they've had those chronic symptoms uh, for a long period of time, and you start, you know, you start seeing those changes like impingement of the shoulder, and you see changes in the rotator cuff where there is that tendinosis or change in the tendon where where other structures are starting to be affected and and you feel the tear is big enough that they may not have that advantage to to move forward therapeutically conservatively i'll have that discussion with them so i i think it's really just it's patient specific it's symptom specific and um and also you know realistically trying to assess what does that patient want out of the surgery. You know, you got to give these patients some realistic expectations, I think, in, in understanding, well, what, you know, what am I going to get out of this repair? You know, most of these people, I think, um, are, are looking, number one, to, you know, help me with the pain. And number two, it's either, can I get back to the sport after this, or can I get back to my job? And, and you know, that, those are, that's kind of the things you got to feel out. Now, when you make, make the decision to, to head to surgery with that patient, what are you trying to accomplish as a surgeon? Is this something that you go in and repair? Is it something that you trim out? Is it something that we might use the term debris, just clear out some of the, the torn tissue? How do you approach these problems surgically? I think it, as, you know, with these labral, with these labral injuries, um, number one, I address all of them arthroscopically. Uh, number two, we'll assess a multitude of, of, of areas within the shoulder uh, to see if there's any combination of things that may be, may be part of that labral injury. But specific to the labrum, um, we'll assess, you know, we, we'll do debridement sometimes if it's more of a degenerative uh, problem. Um, I think we've gotten more from if there's a peeling of the, of the labrum uh, earlier on, I may have done more of repairing those. I've gotten more towards where I do more debridement and I try to make the area, um, I, I try to aggravate it so it, it can heal more on its own without me having to do any type of fixation. And that's more with, with a peeling of the labrum where it's still attached and it's kind of a peel back mechanism where, where I feel that the therapy realm on that other side can be very important. Of course, if there's complete displacement um, we'll look at repairing the labrum either with 
one suture, or two sutures, or three sutures in some type of fixation. So uh, I'm trying to recreate the anatomy the best that I can and, and give that labrum a stable fixation. Now you mentioned that, that this is done arthroscopically and I'm assuming that, that this is also outpatient surgery. Do these patients simply go into day surgery or do you find the need to keep patients overnight after this procedure? Yes, this is a surgery that's a same day surgery. They end up going home the same day and uh, um, they're, most of the patients I would say are, are very comfortable postoperatively. Now let's talk a little bit about what you, you expect of the patient after surgery. Is, is this something that um, they're going to go to physical therapy immediately? Is uh, this something that you uh, put them in some type of a shoulder immobilizer or some type of a brace to wear? And I guess the most important question in this prognosis is, is what is the course of rehab? How long should it be before patients can do things like drive, get back to their jobs, and, and perhaps even get back to fairly vigorous activities like uh, some sort of athletic sport? Well, with, with my labral repairs, if they're strictly labral repairs and the capsule is not involved, I have a little bit more of an accelerated program of rehabilitation. Um, we'll start therapy immediately the next day after these repairs. They're immobilized in a sling. Um, I don't end up, I don't restrict their shoulder to their chest. I just put them in a sling. And the next day we'll actually start passive range of motion exercises uh, as long as it's just purely a labral repair. And we'll typically uh, continue with that passive range anywhere up to four to six weeks and after that time frame we'll go more into an active range and early strengthening where at about the 12 week mark most patients um, you know are have a functional level of the shoulder it, that's about when we can start working really on significant strength issues of the shoulder and I still stay within that four to five month realm of uh, before I'll let somebody get back into a sporting activity. Um, if it's work related, it depends on the type of work they're doing. Some of them may get back to work within three months, but again, I try to stay within that four to five month time frame. Uh, I definitely can move these people faster than my stability and labral injury repairs. If it's just purely labrum and no stabil real stability issues with the capsule, I found that I can I can move them a lot sooner. Um, as far as driving, uh, typically I will let these patients uh, drive the next day after surgery. Uh, they can drive themselves to therapy, um, and uh, we really just it's really encouraging movement um, initially. Now, long term. Um what do you try to tell patients long term about a labral repair? Is this something that's going to give them problems down the road? Is it common to, to have continued degeneration? Or once you repair this, are, are you pretty confident that you've stopped the process and the patient is not going to be bothered with this again? Well, I, depending on the event of the injury that led to this labral tear, if it's more of a trauma depending on that trauma of the shoulder and if the MRI doesn't you know, show me any bone bruising or problems of the cartilage, I give them a, a, a pretty good picture of, of that you know, if we can stabilize this shoulder and get this labrum repaired, we're, we're trying to protect future cartilage injury and, and, uh, and impingement issues and things that can happen to the rotator cuff over time that we're, we're definitely slowing down that process if not stopping that process. If there's been a more significant trauma to the shoulder, I'm telling the patient that, yeah, we're improving your symptoms and improving things over time, but they still may have some, some degenerative changes that do occur over a, a 10 to 20 year time frame that unfortunately I can't control because of that initial injury. Um, so I, I think that's important to try to, to, to make sure that patient understands that. Yeah, I think you did mention that, you know, some of these labral tears are more degenerative. They've been there a while. They, they're they there with other problems in the shoulder, and going in and just trimming it up is not going to fix the underlying problem. We may be able to reduce the symptoms for a period of time, but the process, the underlying process of degeneration is still occurring, and we're not really changing that. We're really just changing the symptoms that they're experiencing from this process. And I guess you would probably tell patients, as I would, that this may require another operation some point in the future 
to go back and either per perhaps do this again or perhaps address other problems in the shoulder that have arisen because of this degenerative process continuing over a period of time. Would you, would you agree with that? Yes, Randy, I, I absolutely agree with that. And, and I try to give, again, the patient the realistic expectation is I'm trying to recreate their original anatomy, but I'm not going to recreate it like it started before the injury. And they have to accept that aspect that, hey, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can to get it functional, pain-free, but understand that these symptoms can progress over time. Well, we... we we have covered this as a potential complication that this may not solve the problem completely. Are there any other complications that you worry about either at the time of surgery or after surgery that has to do with the procedure itself? What do, what do you as a surgeon worry about uh, when you're doing surgery on a labral tear? Well, a couple of the issues with, with labral repairs that, that initially we we worry about is, is patient compliance and making sure that patient understands um, even though they're feeling good it doesn't mean they can start immediately using that shoulder with any type of force lifting activity so forth that that yeah we've repaired that that tissue but it's going to take six weeks for that tissue to heal and putting any demands on that shoulder initially could totally change that surgical outcome. And it, I think that's the hardest thing we have with our patients because they're feeling so good and they think they can do things and, and they can't. Um, I think also, you know, just the obvious things that we look for post-surgical are, are uh, any type of infection, um, increased swelling. Um, we always are looking for those, those problems of where patients are actually losing range of motion and, and some patients can develop uh, stiffness in the shoulder of where they get they get almost frozen shoulder symptoms that, that can occur from the surgery. They're rare um, and it's why we start movement early uh, but they can occur and it's just that shoulder gets into an overdrive healing pattern of, of scarring up and that's something we we look for and, and, and try to keep that patient away from and uh, um, those are some of the initial things that we'll look for. Now, I think this has been a wonderful discussion of, of labral tears, but is there anything we haven't covered, anything as we close that you feel like patients really know, need to know about this disease process? Well, I, I, think, I think it's important for the expectations of the patient to understand um, that it's, it's, it's a lot of work, either conservatively or, or surgically. And, that every shoulder problem is different because we'll always hear that patient say, well, my buddy had that shoulder surgery done and he did great or he was better in so many weeks. And I try to explain to patients that every shoulder injury is different. The mechanics of everything is different and it's specific to a patient. And, and you've really got to, you've got to send that message to the patient so they understand that their shoulder is different than anybody else's and, the, and that the expectations are important for them to, to understand in, in what you're trying to achieve. And I think once you can do that, you're off to a good start with this. Well, I want to thank you for a great discussion about the slap lesion and, and filling us in with information about you know, what, what a slap lesion is, what the glenoid labrum really is, and, and, and what's available to treat it today. So as we close, I want to thank you again for joining us and look forward to further discussions in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. I appreciate it.